Welcome to Money on Tap. Money on Tap, your personal finance headquarters, where we bring out the professionals' experience and some fun in what we call three-dimensional investing, utilizing insurance, brokerage, and fee-based planning. That's what we do on this show. We look at all sides of the issues, and we bring a fully independent planning perspective to the table. Welcome back to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. My name is Seth Crossman, joined here with Ben Brayshaw and Dan Mickelon. How are you guys doing today? I'm doing good, Seth. I'm doing good. I'm looking forward to talking to people about uh, wrenches, hammers, and toolboxes myself. You know? Oh, yeah. That's my favorite part of YouTube, right? You can figure out how to fix anything there. But, you know, hopefully after today's show, um, YouTube's people. getting a few less hits. Yeah. <laughs> fix, your, fix your portfolio with the toolbox. Yeah, there you go. That's funny because just yesterday, Kira and I were out in the yard, you know, talking about plans this that and the other and i was like oh, i'm sure i could watch a little bit of youtube and figure it out building a staircase and you know stone and whatever else i'll get some ideas i've never done it before but i'm sure i've got this i know youtube has made everyone feel like they're a, a superman <laughs> of house well, industrial work i could build i could build a building i could build an oil company i could build anything Absolutely, yeah, I, can, I can do it you know what i loved was that she smiled and had total confidence i was like oh Oh, she actually thinks I can do this. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be fun. We're going to talk about some real estate today in the investment world. For one, it is such a backbone for us here at Brayshaw Financial Group, Money on Tap. It's just a huge part of the investment world. So why wouldn't we get giddy about not only doing some YouTube or doing some projects around our house and learning how to do that, but also sharing some of our experience with investing in real estate. It's a real asset and there's so many different ways to be participating in it. It's a pretty fun topic. I'm looking forward to it. You know, I think real estate is something that's um, a driver of major American wealth. It has been in, in a lot of spaces and we don't really give as much you know time and value to the amount of work we do in real estate, but um, but what people do and how they built wealth, there's statistics out there that say about 12% of Americans have some sort of investment real estate. But I got to be honest with you, I think that number's off. I mean, I was reading that in, uh, is you, in the Google world, and I was thinking to myself, with Airbnb and how some of these things have really kind of blossomed in that space, you know, people have really figured out that, hey, I can own a second property and really not have to manage it as much. And so that's one one area. But about 70% of real estate is owned by individual investors, which is kind of really pretty crazy when you think about how much real estate is out there. Real estate something we're going to take, spend some time on today, and I'm excited about that. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing in the investment world that on a lot of levels, you know, almost all of us are engaged in, in that marketplace. And because it's a necessity, you know, we think of the roof over our heads, it doesn't really, you know, maybe mentally fall into the investment concept. But the truth of it is, is that it is very much an investment, one of the largest ones you'll ever make. And, uh, you know, over time, people have generally enjoyed excellent returns there. Yeah, when we were down in South Carolina making that presentation a few weeks ago. We were talking about that and we were just saying how, you know, when people, you know, they get married, their, their number one largest investment in their lives is their home. Like that is the before the 401k, before everything, it's just their house is their biggest first investment ever. And, you know, some people take it further than that. And I think that's a piece I'm excited to to cover. But yeah, great point, Dan. Well, we're going to get there real soon. Uh, and before we do that, I just want to go ahead and take a uh, moment to thank you, our podcast listener, as well as our radio listener. If you're new to Money on Tap and you're in the podcast world, if you subscribe or like, send us a little note at info at yourmoneyontap.com and we've got something for you. And if you're in the radio world with us today, go over to the podcast venues, check us out and subscribe to Money on Tap. Take us with you through your week, you know, elevate the conversation around the dinner table and wherever you go throughout the day. It's a lot of fun for us to just interact with you here since this is, you know, it's not a totally interactive uh, uh, place. You know, we're. What do you what are you sending out, Seth? Are you sending out personalized signed autograph pictures of yourself? I mean, I mean, you have a voice for radio, but. 
in a phase two. So I don't, I don't know. It's, uh, well, what I've got giving? a calendar I was thinking about calendar? putting out this year. So <laughs> <laughs> it would be one of my, my pets. So don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, we've got something for you. And we want to just thank you for being here with us at Money on Tap. We've been doing this for years and it's been so much fun. It's kind of one of those things that we all look forward to getting together and doing on a weekly basis. And um, we love your questions. And, you know, a lot of the time that engagement brings shows forward because you have questions, you have needs. And that's what we're here to support is you in your journey in uh, personal finance. And hopefully we add some value in our three-dimensional perspective as we're all planners here at Brayshaw Financial Group. And that's what our goal is, is to really help you in your personal finance journey. So with that, we're going to get going into money in the news. And first up on the slate today comes to us from Barron's. Apple announces multi-billion dollar deal with Broadcom to make chips in the U.S. And, and this was authored by Take Him. And I, I thought this was exciting because, you know, we've all in some form or fashion experienced this chip shortage, right? You couldn't get a car, you can't buy utilities or appliances rather. I mean, there's just this ongoing supply and demand issue that I think can only really get worse over time considering that, you know, the vast majority of chips out there are made in Taiwan and there's this whole geopolitical thing going on between themselves and China and, you know, there's just um, some hopefully scenarios that don't play out but if they did could be quite ugly for manufacturing here in the U.S. So uh, to have any kind of a domestic deal get struck to invest in what it takes to build chips here I think is a win for our country, for sure. Yeah, I think this is definitely a great win for the national security side, even though that's not something that's addressed in the article. But I do think that all in all, this is pretty solid. You know, it's interesting. This is in response to Apple's 2021 commitment to invest $430 billion in the U.S. economy over five years. And this represents a total of 1,100 jobs that's going to hit Colorado. Um, I think that's uh, I think that's really great. I mean, you know, it, it's 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 a it's a big step. I wouldn't say I mean, it's more of a drop in the bucket of what Taiwan's doing for us, but but it is it is something that's in the right direction. And I think having some of these things, you know, on U.S. soil is, I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, we were taking over plant, plants during World War II and building tanks. I mean, you know, GM and Ford, like that's what they, <laughs> they were building all sorts of military. So having these plants up and running and ready to go for anything that we might need. I think is extremely valuable to us, and I'm I'm happy we're doing this and um, and moving forward that way. Uh, I want to add to not only the national security, but just in general, like there's diversification, right? We're going to be talking about a very specific sector of investing uh, today, and one of the things, or one of the things in models that we hear all the time is how important it is to have diversification, and I am amazed that very, very large companies with incredibly intelligent people have looked at their long-term real estate and investments in their business and manufacturing in their business and haven't taken a look at that and seriously consider what the limitations are in just solely having a, a, a huge part, which basically you don't have a phone, you don't have a computer unless you have Taiwan and those factories online making your product for you. So good for us or, you know, good for us in the United States, as well as good for, you know, companies that are investing in uh, more of a diversified model. Yeah, well said. I think, uh, you know, if something were to happen, it'd be easier for us to multiply the manufacturing than to be starting from scratch. So uh, the idea that we were setting a footprint and starting to get these factories up and running domestically is, is just a great idea, I think. Yeah. Well, next up, we've got uh, from Jennifer Soar. Where's this, uh, where's this article from again, Dan? Where do we get this one? Business Insider. Oh, Business Insider. Sorry about that. Here's why the U.S. doesn't have to pay off its $31 trillion mountain of debt, according to Paul Krugman. Well, this was, a, this was an interesting article to absorb. <laughs> but, um, but Paul, um, you know, he's a, a very well-known uh, economist, uh, and he compares our government debt to household finances. But the differences he goes through is the idea that, you know, in just in just servicing our debt, we can sell new bonds just to service the debt piece. 
I mean, I appreciate the perspective that, you know, you know, governments don't die, right? The idea that he talks about governments don't die and we can, we can service this debt over a long period of time. We can actually sell more bonds just to service the debt. Um, and that the interest payments on the debt is only around 395 billion. I mean, it's only around that number. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Whatever. Only. Let's just say a third of a trillion dollars. <laughs> um, but it's around 1% of last year's GDP. Now, when I really, you know, when we talk about debt, I think, I think there's a lot missed in the idea of debt because that's the current debt. We talked about this at <laughs> one of our conferences. You, you know, $31, $32 trillion of debt, whatever number you're sitting on and whatever it's going to climb to is one conversation. But that doesn't include, you know, you know kind of the real debt. The real debt is also includes the unfunded liabilities that our government is responsible for that they've promised us, which is Medicare and future payments of Social Security and all of those different things that are years and years off into the future. And that's over $150 trillion. And that's over $900,000 per individual U.S. taxpayer when you break out the numbers. <laughs> and that is a tremendously complicated thing to absorb. Um, so when you start thinking about that, a husband and wife, that's $1.8 million per couple, their portion of the national debt. And I think there's so much to be said about the national debt. And I, I do appreciate the article's perspective that, hey, we're not at terminal velocity yet, but you know we will get there you know at the spending rates that we're at and um it's it's something that i mean i don't know about you but most households don't have 1.8 million dollars you know even to support that debt or anything near that no that's an astronomical number to think of it that way and it's it's certainly alarming you know for sure you know one of the things that he points out here though is that the, the notion of of a government truly closing its debt and paying it off is is you know basically non-existent and he points out the fact that the uh, Great Britain's carried debt going back to the Napoleon era, and that's just their ongoing basis is just to pay down the service fees, right? It's essentially cover the interest due and continue to borrow, which, you know, it's an interesting conversation in light of what we're up against with the debt ceiling and all the stuff going on politically, you know, about how do we... Or the fact that we left the gold standard. <laughs> yeah, and that we've been <laughs> outspending our revenue since 2001. I mean, there's lots of things there that are... Are concerning sixty percent of our budget is covering that only three hundred and ninety five whatever billion dollars of interest. Yeah, so it, it, you know it's one perspective, but it's good to know. It's a little relieving to understand, perhaps. But the fact of the matter is, we still need to be way more fiscally responsible in this country. Oh yeah, and I think I think the other piece of this is that, I, I, and I I do appreciate the fact that he simplifies. Or, or Jennifer Soros simplifies his conversation as well, and the idea that it's like a household budget, but. You know, it's it's a government that's going to outlive it, and we can write new bonds just to service the debt, and that covers a lot of issues for a short period of time, and and so forth. But our country has been moving off of fiscal responsibility for the last hundred years, in all sorts of different ways, including the gold standard. <laughs> you right. know, and that has devalued our assets quite a bit intrinsically. I think when we have a, a bigger problem in the oil world and people not trading oil in the U.S. dollar, so there's a lot of complexities to this. But I would agree with you wholeheartedly that um, fiscal responsibility doesn't seem to be at the center of just about anything these days. Something we need to do. Well, just a, at a glance, right? First of all, I should just go ahead and Google this. Countries that have defaulted on debt, okay? And Greece, Ukraine, Venezuela, Argentina, Ecuador, Sri Lanka, Russia, Ghana, Gangola, Ireland, Spain, Venez uh, Venezuela 11 times. So, I mean – Maybe we're not lumped into the categories of those countries, and I think there is a big difference between the U.S. and any one of those countries that I just cited there, okay? Um, Russia may be the closest as far as anything that I can even take a look and consider, um, but not really. So that's the question that I have is, is that where we're – is that the direction that we're going? Because what he's saying is that countries just don't do that. And, take, and he, he cites uh, the Napoleonic debt in England or, or the UK as an example of that, that they're still carrying that debt. And, and I'm just – I got to kind of shake my head and, and say, well, no, there's plenty of evidence out there that countries do default on these debts and don't carry them long term or don't have the ability to figure that out or have the revenue to be able to carry that capacity. Um, you know, UK is, is, is clearly 
a different country as well in comparison to any one of those other countries that I just cited. So I think um, overall I'm in the camp of we're probably okay for this round, <laughs> but we'll have to kind of wait and see how this how this unfolds over the next 10 years. That's what that's where I'm curious to see is well, it's, it's, is some the, of those, it's, uh, the, it's just the straight up spending and it's something that's affecting everyone's portfolio. I mean, the market is is hiccuping right now as the, you know, as the debt ceiling, you know, crisis, quote unquote crisis, which is just a political you know, negotiation manner, you know, and so forth. No one wants to shut the government down. I mean, that costs more money to start it back up. So I know nobody wants to go that way. And, you know, accusations are flying everywhere. But but the truth is, is that, you know, the spending is out of control. And, you know, if you're not on that camp, you really need to learn more about where we're spending our money. And, I mean, we forgive debt from other countries that we still pay on debt to them. <laughs> Like it doesn't, there's so many moving pieces here. And obviously we can't just, these companies count on some of this revenue to stay afloat. It's like the little brother who, you know, can't survive without you. And, you know, so there's, there's just all these different pieces. And I think ultimately we need to, we need to really get fiscal responsibility of things moving forward and then fix the things going backwards and stop, you know, I mean, we just got to stop spending, you know, additional new things. I'm not running for office. (laughs) (laughs) And up next. Well, that's good because I'm turning I'm turning your house into a chip factory. <laughs> next, to, coming up here in Money in the News from Wall Street Journal, share buybacks continue at torrid pace while investors sit on the sidelines. And this is written by Jack Pitcher. And this is something we've talked about a couple of different times and in a few different perspectives on the show. But the the idea of companies buying back their own stock is something that. Um, you know, on its surface, seems like a, an indicator of a, of a healthy company um, making a, a shareholder-friendly bet on the future of the stock price, and that's um, you know, that's a version of it that we we want to believe is the case. There's, you know, there's some kind of nefarious uh, opportunities there where you know corporate CEOs are trying to you know, potentially pad their bonuses by uh, inflating share price and earnings per share measures and, and different metrics that directly impact their individual compensation, but. From what's happening here, the companies that are largely participating in it, um, you know, I, I think it's more the former than the latter. You know, because what's gone on here is that some of the major kind of ultra large cap tech companies are are the major participants in this buying back shares. It includes Apple, Alphabet, Meta, Microsoft. You know, these are just some of the biggest ones. But um, through the first quarter of this year, they're outpacing last year's record rate of stock buybacks. Well, when you look at this, I mean, this is a really good sign. Uh, It's probably what's floated our market quite a bit over the first quarter, but it's, you know, they're buying stock, so therefore it's pushing this, the price in a, in some northerly direction, even if the stock is falling, it's, it's being, you know, balanced by these share buybacks. I think it's funny that there's 600 billion in shares uh, this year, which is in line with last year's record pace. So, I mean, they're not slowing down at all. You, as you said, they're speeding up. And, you know, this, this says a lot because companies don't buy, want to buy their share for, shares for something they think is overinflated. They sell it when it's high. And like you think about, you know, AMC, right, the <laughs> movie company, the <laughs> stock went skyrocketing. Guess what? They started selling shares, creating new shares and raising funds. And then, you know, when the stock drops, these companies start buying it back. And that's how they make money. It also shows confidence in where they're going. But one of the things a lot of people don't, and for our listeners, I think it's important that um, you understand that for companies who are growth companies, one way they return value to their investors is buying their stock back by inflating the value of the stock to show that growth instead of giving dividends. Some companies distribute dividends in exchange of instead of buying back their shares because if you – one way or another, you're bringing value to somebody. The difference is is when they're buying the shares back, you're not receiving a taxable event by the dividend. You know, and so companies are looking for either growth or value, and you know it's one way to to articulate value in a growth fashion to investors. So I think that's important for people to know. But you know, a lot of buyback companies have been criticized, and, and Biden had done that, and it's pointed out in this article pretty clearly that he had done that regarding a lot of the oil companies um, because they had um, record profits and they were buying their stock back at record pace and. Um, you know, he was he was just basically badgering them for not having increased domestic oil production, which I thought is hilarious but, <laughs> since he shut down everything else. But but he also <laughs> – I'm sorry, Seth's laughing hysterically. So, you know, 
it's just funny to to hear this stuff come out of people's mouths. I, I just can't even believe he'd say it. But in reality, a lot of people have criticized the oil companies for not taking some of those profits and investing those in alternative energies, which would be a much better cited case that a lot of people could get around versus domestic oil production when your first thing in office was to shut down the Keystone Pipeline. Anyways, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, so. I just want the oil companies to have better looking facilities so that, you know, every time I look at the picture of them pumping out whatever online, they look more like a tech company than just, you know, smokestacks and everything else. It just doesn't look right. I don't like it. That's probably what I've got to say about that. Anyways, I was going to say Warren Buffett, you know, hey, he doesn't like all buybacks, but what he does say is that he likes the ones at value accretive prices. What does that mean? Well, he's he thinks buybacks that create shareholder value are good when they create shareholder value, which is just what Ben said. Oh, thanks. <laughs> so I'm going to stick with that. As long as you're in that stock and it's going up, I love it. All right, guys, this is what we're talking about today is we're going to be talking about some real estate without the toolbox. So go ahead and put that hammer down, put that saw down. And when we come back, we will be getting into more money on tap. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Folks, it is so much fun for us to bring you Money on Tap. My name is Seth Crossman, and I am one of the hosts here at Money on Tap. I'm also a financial planner. That's what we do. That's what Ben and I do. And the fun part is, is we get to have this radio show. We talk about important things that we think you need to listen to and be aware of to help raise the bar as far as your financial literacy. It's a big part of what we're trying to do here. The other thing that we're doing here as well, as financial planners, we are welcoming you to come and call us and to join us at Brayshaw Financial Group. Experience what complete wealth management looks like. Let's take a look at all sides of the issue, get a three-dimensional perspective and put a plan around your next step. It's so critical. And so many people just leave this part out and then they find out later, oh, if I only would have known. Hey, don't let that be your story. Give us a call at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. If you have $250,000 of investable assets today, our plan is free to you. We think it's important for you to know the facts and have a playbook so you can have a successful retirement. Give us a call at 855-226-8551. Thanks for listening. We appreciate you listening to Money on Tap with Ben, Seth, and Dan. You can contact us at 855-226-8551 or email us at info at yourmoneyontap.com. And now, more of this week's program. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. Hey, quick reminder for our podcast subscribers out there. Send us a note at info at yourmoneyontap.com or give us a call at 855-226-8551. And hey, we've got something for you. We'd love to get it out to you as soon as possible to just thank you for joining us here at Money on Tap. We're talking about real estate at, without the toolbox. And this is a, again, it's a, it's a conversation at the heart of Brayshaw Financial Group. All of us as planners, we, uh, talk a lot about real estate as it's a backbone. No matter what, wherever you're at, this is how more millionaires per capita are created. And we first of all recognize that. And we also recognize that it is, it's real. It's real property. And there's only so much of that real estate. And yes, it doesn't mean that you invest in real estate and you have some kind of a more secure or protected or guarantee or any of that stuff. It's just an asset class that we really want people to be aware of. And we also want, you know, recognize that more people have their highest amount of investing or investment inside of their home usually. And that's where a lot of investing starts is inside the home. So with that, we're not going to spend too much time talking about that kind of investing in real estate today, but we're going to dive more into some compare and contrast of different kinds of real estate. Um, and if you are a real estate investor and you feel also that you've kind of gotten locked into 
real estate because typically real estate or forms of real estate are illiquid. There are some ways that uh, are available, and we won't talk too much about that, but we just want to let you know that there's some ways to get unstuck in real estate as well. All yeah. right. We've got, I mean, just there's people get locked up in 401ks and IRAs. Well, guess what? People get locked up in real estate as well. And there's ways to transition assets. And it's just knowing how to do that. And timing is a part of that as well. So that's a part of the conversation that we also want to welcome you to have with us at Brayshaw Financial Group. Yeah, well said, Seth. I think there's like tax concerns, whether it's a retirement plan or real estate, and trying to mitigate those is something that can be done in lots of different ways and, and things that we help people with every day. Um, but from a real estate perspective, I think you know real estate we talked about is a big part of the American wealth system. It has become something that a lot of people have, you know, I, I, I have clients who are like, I made all of my money through real estate. And now I, I don't owe anything on the real estate. And I just want to collect my checks. But there's a point in time, too, when, you know, managing that, that real estate has its own hassles. You know, you get that phone call at, you know, five in the morning and the person's screaming at you because they don't have hot water or the refrigerator's broken or the, you know, the plumbing's leaking or, you know, they don't have electricity or, you know, whatever happens. I mean, there's a thousand things that people don't want to deal with with the hassles. And there's points in times where people want to exit it. But exiting it entirely from your overall portfolio is something a lot of people are like, well, I, I still want to have a, a piece of real estate. Real estate is an investment asset class. And um, some people exclude it. And I, I know a lot of planners who sit down and say, well, I invest in these domains and you handle the real estate piece. Like they, they see it as a domain that you handle. We look at it as, you know, entirely encompassed in all of our planning, whether you're managing the real estate or we are, it is part of the whole perspective of, of real estate management. But there's either, you know, hard asset real estate that you get to invest in and manage yourself, that duplex, triplex, whatever, um, or that uh, apartment you have in your basement, whatever that concept is and that could pay space for you, that's one piece. But then there's this whole other domain called REITs, real estate investment trusts. Um, REITs have been around since the 1960s. They're you know, um, an asset class that uh, has evolved to allow people to invest in real estate because I got to be honest with you, there are a lot of people out there that have no idea how to manage any sort of office building or apartment complex, and it's not their ability or domain, but they do believe it to be a valid investment. And REITs have opened up that space. It's a conglomerate of various pieces of real estate uh, in different domains. You could have offices, you could have apartments, you could have homes, you could have uh, storage units, you could have all sorts of different real estate programs that are buying lots of different real estate pieces. And it looks and smells kind of like a mutual fund, I think, or an ETF, if, if I would describe it in that capacity, where you're not buying a REIT that has one property, it might have 50 properties or 100 properties, or it might have five properties. It could be any of those things. Yeah, there are some definitions to what to what makes a REIT, right? And this is um, what Congress enacted in 1960 when they established this um, real estate investment trust. And the, the criteria that make an investment like this a REIT are that uh, return a minimum of 90% of taxable income in the form of shareholder dividends each year. So the vast majority of what a REIT takes in as a company must be passed through to the shareholders, 90% or above. At least 75% of the total assets need to be in real estate or cash and receive at least 75% of gross income from the real estate, such as rent or interest on mortgages or financing of the real estate itself. And they must have a minimum of 100 shareholders in the first year of existence. So it is, it is kind of an all-encompassing opportunity to, you know, much like Ben said, you invest in a mutual fund, you're buying shares of many, many different companies in a single investment. When you buy a REIT or, or consider a REIT, what you're looking at there is owning pieces of many different properties in a single investment. And I think, I think from a risk standpoint, you know, REITs can be pretty high risk. I mean, it's, it's probably as high risk as you get because real estate itself is a high risk investment. And we don't think of it that way. We, we buy our house. We know what houses are worth in the area. And, you know, it, it seems normal to us. And then we start getting invested in real estate, but we don't realize the volatility of real estate. And, and we're seeing a lot of that right now in the world around us. Um, you know, we were chatting before the show, just of the volatility in the in the office space world in these big cities is just, it's tragic. I mean, you people don't 
People don't want to go to their office downtown. They don't want to get shot. They don't want this to happen or that to happen. So how do you mitigate those risks inside of a piece of real estate? But at the same time, and and Dan, you pointed this out, is 90% of that revenue needs to be distributed. So, you know, the government is holding them accountable to push that income out to you. So a lot of people in that domain like these types of investments because they, they, they know they have to receive the income. But like any investment, if you don't have tenants in real estate, there is no income. Yeah, and that's where I was going to go. There's a couple of really big, important variables here, and tenancy is absolutely huge. And the, the other one is, you know, what's the financing structure of the REIT itself? You know, they're subject to interest rates. And, uh, you know, if they own property outright, that's one thing versus, you know, having leverage to purchase it and, you know, on variable rate basis, you know, they can find themselves in a kind of upside down position, much like speculative real estate investors who buy property outright can. And then that really, you know, puts a damper on that 90 percent pay through of of whatever revenue they can generate. So there's really three different broad classifications of REITs. And then those are brought, broken down into uh, three separate as well, underlying those. So there's your equity REIT, a mortgage, and then a hybrid REIT. And then there's also the publicly traded REITs, which you can go out on the stock market and find, and like we've t- discussed, trade kind of like ETFs. Then there's public non-traded REITs, and then there's private REITs. And you know each one of these kinds of REITs really carries its own char- characteristics and its own risks. So... It's really important to try to, as much as possible, understand what's under the hood. Um, You know, many of these REITs are completely untradeable. And once you're locked in, you're locked in. I mean, that's one of the characteristics around real estate. And then there's others that are are tradable, but they definitely do have intrinsic uh, uh, volatility can be a part of it. They can shut down dividends, which can be another part of it. So overall, it's really important to have a a good understanding of these. So in equity REITs, they operate more like a landlord. Uh, They handle and manage all the tasks associated with owning the property. Mortgage REITs, it's unlike equity REITs. They're mortgage REITs or M REITs. Um, They don't own the underlying property. Instead, they own debt securities backed by the property. Um, example of this is when you know family takes out a mortgage on a house. This type of REIT might buy that mortgage from the original lender and collect monthly payments over time, generating that revenue or the interest income. Uh, and then the hybrid REITs, which are you know a combination of both, basically. If you're listening to Money on Tap, you can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. Hey, did you know that we're also on Facebook? We're out there. You can find us on LinkedIn, Uh, any of the podcast venues. Go ahead, subscribe, download. If you do, send us a message at info at yourmoneyontap.com. We've got a gift for you, uh, and we look forward to connecting with you. With that, today we are talking about real estate without the toolbox. So go ahead and put down your hammer and saw for a little bit and join us in the conversation. I'm betting that you actually own some real estate. Or you've participated maybe in some of the real estate that we're talking about. Or even better, you're wondering about real estate and wanting to be a like wanting to be a real estate investor. Well, this is cool. So we're gonna go ahead and jump in with more about investing in real estate. Well, you know, you know, Seth, you make a great point. I mean, there's probably most of our listeners own some form of real estate in general, and probably most of them are involved in investing in real estate, whether they know it or not. I think You know, we were actually looking at a chart here. You know, it says that about 150 million Americans, just shy of half of America, own some form of REITs in their portfolio. And I think, you know, what's really interesting about that is that there's there's probably buried in some mutual fund or, you know, some, you know, diversified portfolio connection or underlying ETF. Like there is some exposure you know, and I bet you anything that, you know, I would say probably every one of our clients has some exposure to uh, real estate. I mean, I know in our, in, in our blue chip portfolio, we, we have REITs, <laughs> you know, we do. So, um, you know, exposure to that portfolio would, would give you that opportunity. But I think real estate's not just found in REITs that are traded on the New York Stock Exchange or, or whatever. It's, it, they're found in other, real estate's found in other ways to invest. I was just, I mentioned in the pre-show, um, 
you know, Airbnb. Like, I mean, you can, you know, you can get exposure to other people renting real estate through <laughs> something like that. I'm not promoting that stock, but it's just a, an idea that you can get real estate exposure in lots of different ways and in investments. And it's important what Seth said about there's what we call traded, which means it trades like a stock on the stock exchange as a traded real estate investment program. Or there's a non-traded. And we're not talking about non-traded whatever. I mean, the whole point of non-traded is that it's not traded anywhere. Like you have to go out and get a private you know, solicitation. There's all sorts of that. And honestly, some of those work and some of them fail. And when they fail, they fail big. So that's a huge high risk area. And I would encourage you to probably steer clear unless you're a real avid investor and you know exactly what you're doing and you don't need to talk to us anyways at that point from the real estate side. Like you're already engaged there. Um, and we've worked in that space and we've had, we've had some pretty good success in that space as well. But the traded REIT space, these are already defined. They're already available, already mature real estate programs that are continuing to buy and sell real estate and, and manage that portfolio is what it is. And I I think it's really important to know that there's lots of different domains. And Seth, you were chatting about this a little bit, but I mean, you can buy something as as specific as a healthcare kind of real estate program. Like you can say, I just want to be in healthcare. I really believe healthcare is a place that I want to be in. And I really like the real estate side of it. Like you can find real estate programs that focus on that space, or I just really like office. Office is, you know, under major turmoil, I think, you know, let's say you think it's, uh, you know, oversold and there's opportunity there long term, and that might be the case. Well, there's office property only real estate programs or storage or um, uh, there's IT infrastructure programs. I mean, there's even warehouses that you can buy inside of real estate programs. So you can figure out there's domains that you can get. So it's not as it can be as broad and balanced as you want, or you can be you can find programs that are really specific. And I think that's really an interesting space because you can really target something that you feel is is an opportunity in that world. Yeah, like a lot of investments, particularly ETFs that we talk about a lot, you can get very granular in terms of what kind of REIT you want to buy into um, if there's a, a certain sector that you think is going to be hot. Uh, I remember years back having conversations around you know, medical office building space, you know, that was, that was a hot one, um, you know, server, you know, holding warehouses, you know, really dedicated to tech uh, infrastructure and hardware and where you house that stuff. So that type of REIT is certainly out there and can be found. And that's something that if you have an interest in, give us a call, we can discuss. But if you, if you take a look at how has, how have REITs done as an asset class, Right. So where does it fit in a portfolio and, and, you know, why is there this interest in it? If you take a look at the 20-year history going back here and looking at an all-equity REIT, which collects data on publicly traded REITs only, equity REITs, it's actually outperformed the Russell 1000 in the last 20 years uh, by a difference of 11.6 on the REITs versus the Russell's return at 6.29%. I mean, you're, you're approaching double. It's a, it's a substantial gap there, yeah, yeah, for sure. And the Russell 1000 comprises, you know, some of the, the very largest large cap companies in our, you know, in our country. So uh, there is a track record there, and the track record is pretty strong. And I think, you know, that's a total return. So that would probably, I mean, I'm presuming that's including actual distributions yeah, too. I wonder if it's including distributions with reinvestment or not. I bet you it is, but. Mm be curious to find I would dig into that a little more I'd be curious but, yeah. but it's you're right Dan I mean it, it's an asset class and honestly with the baby boomer space and people looking for active income it's a great place to potentially find for active income matter of fact I was looking at MFS's um, uh, chart and um, I was thinking about <laughs> I was thinking about that and I was looking at there's um, the 20 year average history for um, the 20 year average history for performance you know, large cap growth was number one. Um, number, to, number two was the small and mid cap. Number three was REITs. And number four was large cap value. And I think that's really interesting because, you know, REITs are playing. That was all better performing than a diversified portfolio. All four of those domains, which I thought was interesting when you really break it down. And I, a lot of that has to do with the bond performance. But, you know, for the diversified portfolios not having what they need. But what we have noticed over the last 20 years is the demand for big companies and income seem to be kind of, you know, coming to the surface of the investment world. It's another asset that pays you to own it, which is something we talk about often in mm -hmm. the retirement space in particular. 
You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. We are talking about real estate without the toolbox. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. For a number of our listeners, they have a lot of questions, and you might be one of them. Today, we're just offering what we call Zoominars, webinars over Zoom meeting rooms where we have top experts, social security, estate planning, and financial planning experts for you to speak with, do a private consultation that way today. We're also having webinar-based Zoominars where we're going to have multiple groups where you can be part of that and enjoy that as well. Give us a call at 855 855- 226-8551 or email us at info at yourmoneyontap.com to schedule your Zoominar. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or email us at info at yourmoneyontap.com. And now, more Money on Tap with Ben, Seth, and Dan. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. Uh, those are great places that you can reach out to us. If you're a podcast subscriber or if you're on the radio, go over to the podcast, subscribe, send us a message, say hello. Let us know um, if you have a topic that you would like us to cover that's actually one of the the funnest shows that we get are those shows that you bring to us and we get an opportunity to give back to you. And, um, and it's fun to have that because that's, you know, we're, we're here, we're on the radio, we're doing this stuff in our studio. You're not here with us. We don't get the, uh, the opportunity to see your smile unless you come visit us at Brayshaw Financial Group. So we appreciate those connections and we want to thank you by sending you out uh, something to say thank you. That's that. We're talking about real estate without the toolbox. And we've been really focused on this REIT structure inside of investing in real estate. And if you're at this point kind of wondering, like, wait a second, this is, okay, so this is real estate, but you're talking about trading it like a stock. But then you're also saying that maybe you can't do that. Well, I get it. That's that's pretty understandable at this point in time in the conversation. Okay, so some of that is going to have to be a, full, a bigger conversation down the road. And the answer to both of those questions that you're having right now are yes, that, that might be your experience in investing inside of real estate. And the wrapper that is typically found inside of investing in real estate, whether it's you know owning it in you know um, a direct fashion, which can be an illiquid investment, or if you're owning it uh, through uh, trading it on the market, that's going to be a liquid investment. Inside, under the hood, it's still real estate. It's just a matter of how you own it and how you participate. So there's different rules and different functions around that. There's different reasons why you might be interested in doing those different kinds of investments. Regardless, we also have some benefits, right? So we've talked about, I think, quite a few of the positives, and we've got some drawbacks and some benefits, and we just kind of want to hash some of that out with you here before we go. So direct real estate. Ben, what do I, what do I mean when I say direct real estate? Well, that's you know somebody owning the property themselves, like has nothing to do with an investment in the marketplace. They, they go out and they buy a building, uh, a, a piece of property, a piece of real estate that that is a, um, their own piece. And I think from a financial planning standpoint, when you're sitting with a planner, they should know you know how much real estate you own because your portfolio, whether it's direct real estate or whether you're buying something in a, you know, in the investment world, real estate piece, you know, you want to make sure you're not unbalanced, you know, and you're overweighted in real estate. Like it doesn't make sense to buy direct real estate and then start loading up on REITs. I mean, that just, that just, <laughs> I tell people all the time, you know, you can be real estate rich and cash poor, you know, like you could, <laughs> you know, cause when you have direct real estate, one of the, one of the biggest problems is it's, it's typically illiquid. You know, I mean, trying to find a place in time. Right now, interest rates are rising, and the and the values of real estates depending on the the area you're living in. And New Hampshire is kind of not in that space right now, which is interesting. But in most places, when re, when uh, when rates rise, 
uh, real estate values drop because people can only afford a certain amount according to the value of a, of a property. Uh, but that direct real estate, I mean, it has, you know, guys, it has a lot of advantages, um, you know, because, you know, you, you, you manage it, you own it, you, it's yours. Like you, you can decide when to buy and sell it. It's something that, you know, you can leverage, you can borrow against, um, you know, the income's a hundred percent yours. The capital gains is a hundred percent yours. It's, there's profits, there's benefits. Like you get to strategically find a property in a location that you believe to be uniquely special and long-term advantageous for yourself. But on the backside, you got transaction costs that are expensive and it's, it's the toolbox, Seth, you know, it's, it's the toolbox. Yep. Like, I mean, it's from yeah. a standpoint, like you got to pull out the hammer. If someone's calling you, it's, it's, it's your problem. And, um, you could feel alone in that. And then you have to fight to get a contractor in if it's something that's, you know, really, really important. I mean, I actually, you know, one of our office spaces, we had, we have a tenant in one of them and, you know, uh, the boiler was getting looked at and so forth and they had to c- come and do something to it and they put the wrong size pipe in and the inspector said, that's the wrong size. Now I'm fighting to get somebody, you know, in there to get the right size pipe. And they, I have the, the, uh, the, the, the heating company arguing with the inspector that they irrelevant of the size pipe. It does what it's supposed to do. And, <laughs> You know, it's like those things are are things that have to sit on your shoulders when you have direct real estate. It's funny to hear you talk about the boiler room of Brayshaw Financial Group. <laughs> the and, boiler uh, room. <laughs> <laughs> that's something we just don't do over here in Portland. You know, that's we left that over on the East Coast for you and we upgraded. <laughs> Not really. We're just kidding. So. You're right. There's there's a lot of benefits in there, and the benefits are yours as a direct real estate owner. Um, and the drawbacks are yours as well. That illiquidity is a factor for some people. And, um, you know, and it is interesting, too, how many people uh, that own real estate, and that's what they know, that's what they do, you know, and then they're, that's, that's 100% of how they've built their wealth, and that's exactly what they're going to continue to do. But sometimes we get into these conversations where they have a question of how do I stop doing real estate or as much real estate as I have been doing? How do I own it differently? And I think that's one of the, one of the things that a REIT also can support because maybe you've just been in the game of real estate of, you know, buying and selling and flipping and, and, and really doing, um, you know, a great job of creating passive income and wealth in, you know, single family homes or duplexes or fourplexes, but you've got this other option that you would really like to explore, which is, you know, some more commercial real estate. And unless you are a commercial real estate investor or you have a broker, which is the thing I would advise anybody in this world to do is have a broker that's got their CCIM and understands how to really invest and go through an, what's it's called underwriting a deal is what it's called. You want to know the financials and how the financials are going to work. And guess what? You don't find those deals when you're just like grooming through the MLS, looking online or driving by a property. Unless God speaks divinely to you about that property, which we've got clients and we have those those conversations as well. It happens that way. Real estate can be God ordained and we fully believe it. That's a ben that's a benism right there and I love that that real estate can really be that way. Um and but most of the time it's going to take some work. It's going to take some understanding of how to pull the value through and really understand the financials around that. Um, and it's not at a glance. So, with the REIT structures or some of the other structures that are uh, out here for investing in larger types of real estate, I would typically say that those are those are typically larger kinds of real estate. They're you know healthcare hospitals. There's you know you there's there's shipping facilities. There's, um, gosh darn it, there's, well, again, the mortgages was another one that we were talking about earlier. So what are the benefits there? You can have profits without having to own or manage. That's putting that toolbox aside. Um, you can have higher than average dividends compared to the stocks and bonds because the way that a REIT is uh, constructed, constructed, it has to, by law, has to push out those dividends to you. They can be easier to buy or trade or sell if they're liquid. And by liquid, we mean that right now I can go to Yahoo Finance and type in ticker symbol and it's a REIT. I can buy it. I can sell it. That's liquid. 
it might not also, be the liquidity you want, but it's 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 something you can do <laughs> on a moment's notice. Where, yeah, I mean, I think right. I think that's the piece about direct real estate. It's illiquid because you know you you're going to have to find a buyer, you have to find somebody who's going to pay it, and it's going to close, and it's going to close in. 60, 90, could, could be six months. You know, it, it just depends because of due diligence and so forth. So I guess one of the things I'm thinking about is just the diversification. Like you might be somebody who is an avid real estate investor and I wouldn't want to say, hey, get unbalanced. But, you know, let's say you have an apartment REIT, but you're like, you know, I really should have some office exposure. So I'm not overly focused on apartments or, you know, geographically, you know, I own real estate in a couple of different places, but I should own some real estate in a different area of the country. Those are opportunities for diversification. I think the biggest issue about REITs is that you don't control the properties that they own. You're subject to them buying and selling them, right? Um, you, you lack control over the returns or the performance. You know, you're, you're going to absorb capital gains. You're going to absorb all of those taxable events. And it may not be the time in which you want to do it. Like those are some major disadvantages of, of all of these, of these spaces. So it's, it's kind of interesting, but I, I do I, you know, appreciate the comment Dan had about um, – you know, you know, the, you know, the performance of real estate over the historical space. And I think, you know, with the baby boomer range and people understanding that they made a lot of wealth through real estate, you know, I think, you know, the, the traded REIT space on the market, you know, it, it, it does have some opportunities if you, if you can ride it out and, and, um, you know, you can ride it out and find different, you know, sectors that you think are going to be of value long term because they historically have performed and people want income in retirement. That's the big solve. How do I get my income for retirement? How do I, you know, how do I recreate my paycheck? And and we we work on that for people every day. I had a meeting today about that and, you know, working with the gentleman of just, you know, here is your paycheck. It's just coming in a different form and building a financial plan that creates that you know, in, in this conversation today, it's just so much about, you know, just finding investments that can create paychecks for you, whether it's dividend stocks, whether it's real estate programs, whether it's annuities, what, you know, whether it's bonds, it doesn't really matter to us what you own. It's just about getting you into a place that has familiarity, comfort, reliability as best we possibly can. And and, you know, for somebody who's getting out of maybe physical hard real estate, but really is comfortable with the understanding of real estate and producing income, this could be an alternative for a portion of your portfolio that could help you feel like you're filling something you understand well, if you're a real estate investor. Well said. Part of that is you just really need to understand that there's some lack of control over those returns, you know, and the performance of those properties. And... And sometimes that's that's for certain kinds of investors, that's just a really hard thing to to wrap your head around. You guys, this is this has been a really great conversation. We hope that you've enjoyed spending the time with us here talking about real estate. We did actually kind of start off the show saying, hey, if you're locked into real estate and kind of need to unwind parts of those portfolios and sidestep some of the tax events that happen, if you're selling real estate, there's a lot to consider in selling real estate or outside of your, your primary residence. There's a lot to consider. And if that's you, we have strategies, we have ways, we have um, a lot of fun engaging with you and teaching you through the process of how to step out of real estate, not necessarily have to, uh, or trans, let's say, let's transform the way that you you own the real estate is what that looks like more um, and not have to pay those taxes on the way through, which is typically one of those things that people kind of get locked into like, Oh my gosh, I've got all this real estate. I've done great, but I'm just not wanting to have to pick up the hammer um, or the um, be the plumber or contact the person to take care of all this stuff for me. There's some really great tools that we have here for you at Brayshaw Financial Group. Ben, did you have something that you wanted to say about that before we close out? Yeah, I was just thinking that, you know, if, if exit strategies in real estate is something you're looking for, we're, we're a good place to call and, and discuss your options around that because there are opportunities. I think that's important for you to say, you know, for you to have said, Seth, it's, it's just people do feel, I can't tell you how many people feel burdened by this huge investment asset that they've depreciated over a lifetime that they're not sure how to to exit that and exit it well without without having a massive tax burden and that's something that we can we can help people with so that's it yeah hey we talk about that all the time what's your exit strategy right 
So you've got both sides of it here, getting in and getting out. And it's a lot of fun. You've been listening to Money on Tap. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or info at yourmoneyontap.com. Be successful in your investing. We look forward to seeing you here next week. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of this radio station and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. No strategy, product, material, or tool mentioned can assure a profit nor protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information, products, materials, or tools mentioned should be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. This show may be subsidized in whole or in part by a product sponsor or issuer. Securities and advisory services offered through Sage Point Financial Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC, and a registered investment advisor. All other services offered through Brayshaw Financial Group LLC are independent of Sage Point Financial. Sage Point Financial and Brayshaw Financial Group do not provide tax or legal advice. Main office is located at 116 South River Road, Bedford, New Hampshire. 03110 and can be reached at toll free 855 226 8551. Well, bye.